Okay, so we're session 14. Uh, we're going to try to get through this today as best we can. Loan education program, mining scenarios. Uh, and, you know, we've gone through the 504. You guys remember that? You know, 504, just quick, high level, you know, small business loan along with the 7A. Distinction is... 50% first, 40% second, 10% equity injection. Okay. It's fixed for 20 years on that second piece, or 25, depends. Um, hefty prepay, bank does their 50 in normal terms. It's a good loan for small business owners if they want to limit their down payment. Okay. Um, and remember, you always have to occupy 51% of the space. Okay, that's really important. Um, the 7A loan, remember, is again, same thing, 90%. The bank actually funds the loan themselves. So the SBA really is like an insurance policy to them. And they're saying, we're going to give you the certificate and saying if there's a default, we will back you, assuming you did it the right way. Uh, that's why they're so stringent about following these little dinky rules. Okay. It's a 531 on the prepay. It's extremely expensive on the fees, two and a half to three percent on fees based on 75% of the loan amount. And if you remember, they could slap a lien on your house okay so nobody's excited about having excess liens on their home <laughs> uh, and even when you tell them about it they don't really listen and then they get to the end and they go what's that it's a lien on your home and everybody freaks out okay so we so it's an area that we have lots of disclosure up front so that people don't panic okay so those are two of the major programs that get done for small businesses. People can do owner-occupied. They put more money down if they go conventionally. But these are the reason why most of this stuff gets capitulated or gets done is because of the federal government provides this stuff. So there is a positive to it. There's also a negative to it. Okay, so each each program has their own pros and cons. Uh, Freddie Mac program, you guys remember that's for housing, predominantly rental housing. Okay, so they don't do for sale, but it's rental type of housing. So senior housing would go under that. You know uh, what I call unassisted living. So that means, you know, someone gets old enough and they're like, hey, we don't need help, but we should probably be in some sort of facility that, you know, is catering to the 60, 70, 80 plus. Okay. Um, and remember, they're going to do, they're the most competitive in the marketplace. If you ever get into the apartment space, Freddie and Fannie dominates. Not right now, because interest rates are just wacky, uh, but they dominate. They, they do the majority of the volume. Uh, it's non-recourse, 30-year amortization. They can do interest only on it. And if you remember that, you know, it closes in 45 to 60 days, uh, and they're going to fund probably 70 to 80% of the purchase price on those things. Fannie and Freddie do not do construction. Okay, these are not construction loans. FHA and HUD does. So you hear this program every so often if you do get in the industry called the HUD 221D4 program. That is a uh, larger type of construction loan. We're not going to get into that, but it is something just to at least kind of lock in the back of your head. Okay. Um, life company loans. Do you guys remember kind of anything about the life company loans? What were some of the 
characteristics of those laws, if you remember. Yeah, so they, I mean, they wanted to be extremely conservative just because, you know, people are paying premiums and they don't really want to lose people's money. So it's over a long-term investment horizon. Yes. Uh, their portfolios are like 80% bonds and stocks and the other 20% they put in like a safe asset. It's a uh, amateur, I think it's seven, 10 and 15 years. Yes. Um, yeah. And, and remember recourse versus non, they do both. But, you know, and remember, they're focused predominantly on the asset, okay? They mean they're, you know, it's kind of like CMBS, Life Companies, Freddie Fannie. They're really underwriting the asset predominantly. They do care about the experience. That matters a lot. But they're really looking at the asset as the primary source of repayment. When you deal with banks... Banks are more focused on the individual. They're almost underwriting them. Then they're looking at the asset itself. Okay. So it's a little bit, it's not equivalent, but it's kind of, that's, that's the lens which they look at things. If you go into 10 banks, they're going to tell you the same thing. We are a relationship bank. What they're trying to tell you is we want your money <laughs> to come in as deposits and we're going to lend uh, to you as more of an owner occupied type of person in your business. Okay. So those are life company loans. It's a good thing to know. And remember they work through, remember that C word, they work through what kinds of people, do you remember? tricking you. Well, I'm not tricking you, but I'm testing. <laughs> so it's uh, remember, they don't, you don't 90% of the time, you're not going to go direct to the life insurance company. Okay. Who are you going to go through? Do you remember the name of that? It starts with a C. It starts with a C. This is subsidiary. Um, Core is correspondence. Correspondence. Okay. So a correspondent, remember, is a third party who services the loan, which means they have someone set up dedicated to collect the payments every month. Okay. And then they get paid a premium, a little service premium for doing that. Okay. And so they make money on doing that. And that means they send out notifications, they go do inspections, all those types of things. Okay, they're correspondent. So life companies are very, like, it's kind of this little unique niche world because you're not going to pick up the phone and call life companies and say, hey, I want to do a loan. They just live in this little corner and nobody knows about it. They're just, in fact, you guys probably didn't even know they did this. <laughs> You know, you probably like life companies do that. Yes, it's just very under the wraps. Uh, so, you know, but they do a tremendous amount of volume. CMBS loans. Do you remember the acronym? Commercial mortgage backed securities. Yep, commercial mortgage backed securities. Okay, so remember that they. What's the amortization they typically do? And What'd you say? Third, did you say 30? I said 30. Yeah, 30, that's right. 30 year am. Uh, they usually go about how high on the stack. It depends on where you're at in the cycle, but they can usually go about how, how high on the loan to value. Remember how high they'll go? They could go to 75 to 80. But, yeah, the loan to value. So remember, loan, how high are they going to lend money? Okay, and they'll go high. Are they recourse or non-recourse? What is it? Non-recourse. Non-recourse, that's correct. It's non-recourse loans. Okay. And 
they um, are expensive to do the loan, and they do large loans. Okay, so I'll see if I can pull up a little document here for you, to give you an idea of the types of loans that they do. Let's see. Apartment, apartment, apartment. Function. Right. Must have put it away. Um, if I find it, I'll show you guys. But they, you know, they'll do 500 million, 600 million. You know, they do big, they do big loans. Okay. Um, soft. Okay, so we're gonna talk about hard money, soft money loans. Okay. Um, and so, what did you guys learn about a hard money or soft money type of loan? Um, they're used for general commercial properties. Um, the guy in the video, his firm was like 250K to 3 million. Mm -hmm. And he had like three different onsets. He had like a five term, five year classic, a one year bridge, and I think a two year bridge. Um, they're typically higher interest rates just because they're more of a short, short term loan. Yeah. So I think it's around 9%. But every time you drop 5% and load into value, um, got a half a percent off of the interest rate yes. uh, around 65 percent loan value that's right and they have no or uh, they have fixed interest rates and no premium prepayment penalty and the two point or origin fee yep origin, no fee. origin fee then but that's what i got from that video so it's, a, it's called an origination fee so the origination fee means that we're charging fees or points on top of the loan uh, when you close. So like we charge fees uh, to originate the loan for somebody, okay? Um, so hard money loans, why would somebody go get a hard money loan? I mean, they need quick financing. They don't necessarily do extensive underwriting. It's more so focused on like the value of the property, um, where it's located, kind of what its purpose, uh, what the general purpose. Yes. Uh, yeah, speed, right? You got to close in one week. You're not going to the bank. Uh, if, you, um, if you have a bunch of uh, dings on your credit, you know, probably going to go hard money. You know, if you have some bad issues in your past, probably going to go hard money. Um, you know, some people just flat out don't like banks and they don't care. And they're just like, I'll pay the money so I don't have to go through the brain damage of giving all this documentation. And they would just rather do that. Okay. Um, or if something is like beat up, tired, old, uh, and they just want to turn it around, doesn't have any history to it. And bank's not going to do that. Um, you know, if it's land, bank's probably not going to do that. So, you know, hard money is there. It serves a purpose, um, you know, and they're going to, they're pretty much just like you said, the lender is just really looking at that piece of collateral and they're saying to themselves, if I, because we've done it in here plenty of times, I've lent the money to people and said, okay, the way I look at it is I said, I, I will give you the money if the worst case scenario is the best case scenario for my investors. So what that means is that if I had to foreclose on your property, I'd be happy as a camper <laughs> to own that property. At that, at that loan, okay? Um, that's the way we look at it. Not that we wanna foreclose on somebody, not that we wanna take their asset back, but we look at it that way. So I don't really care per se uh, about all the nuances of the borrower. 
Um, I do want to know if they've had fraud or not. So we do look at that, but I don't care if they have crappy credit. I don't really care about their past. It just doesn't matter because I'm just, all I'm trying to say is we're going to lend you the money. How do we get taken out of it? And you know, there you go. That's, that's the mentality of a hard money lender. They're going to look at the value of that and say, if retail value is here, they're going to look at more of a wholesale value. Okay. What we call fire sale. What do you think I mean by fire sale? means that when like the property goes under foreclosure and then it goes on a fire sale of who just wants to buy the property for whatever, you know, where the highest bid is. Yeah, correct. I mean, when you think about a fire sale, if you, uh, you know, if all of a sudden you were in a pickle and you were like, I got to get rid of this house. What do you think you're going to do? You're going to drop the price, right? Until all of a sudden people go, Let's get that thing. And so that's the way they look at it and say, well, I don't want to know what it's worth at retail. I want to know what it's worth at wholesale because I want to take it out at wholesale and liquidate it fast. Okay. Um, now this all goes back to the same thing. If you, if, if I, if you get nothing outside of this whole internship, uh, other than my good looks, then you can basically say, <laughs> you can basically say that every, Everything around this industry is risk and reward. That's all it is, right? If I mitigate the risk and increase my reward, that's what I'm trying to accomplish, okay? So that's what they're doing. They're saying, you know, if I have to foreclose on this thing, how do I mitigate my risk and get my return back to the investors? I'm reading through this book right now uh, by Steve Schwartz, whatever it takes. And he says, my number one rule about uh, investing clients' money, and we're talking about you know billions and billions and billions of dollars. He says, don't lose their money. <laughs> and he says, everybody always looks at me and says, That's, that is too simplistic. That is the dumbest thing I've ever heard. And he says... It's not, he said, it's just, that's all I'm thinking about. Do not lose the client's money, <laughs> period. Um, it's a good rule. So you're thinking all the time, like what could lose the money, right? So that's that's how hard money looks at things. And all of a sudden that it closed fast, it's high interest rates, um, you know, they can be expensive on fees, but you know, there's very little documentation and uh, that's that rule, okay? Um, you can make a career out of it. Uh, I've met many people that do and they'll just, they'll just build a hard money lending uh, portfolio and you get paid fast. So, you know, for certain people that works really, really well. It does come with its own headaches. You know what the, the like typical default like out of all hard money loans, um, what the typical like default rate is? Yeah, it's a great question. You know, it really depends on each lender. It's such a it's such a uh, bifurcated and spread out industry. Uh, there's no like uniform uh, reporting system for hard money lenders. There should be, and maybe someday there will be. Um, I would just tell you that most of the hard money lenders I know, um, very rarely do they lose money. Um, you know, there was one group in town called Mortgages Limited. And I remember when he was alive, he actually committed suicide, uh, which was really sad, but he was lending money and he just started getting like more and more aggressive and he was charging these enormous fees, he was making a ton of money, uh, but he was just doing these crazy loans, 90% on land, and I mean, that's just asinine. I mean, most people are doing 50% against land. 
So it just eventually bit him in the butt in 08, and he was so deep into it that he just took his own life. He just couldn't do it. Um, so, you know, it, I would just say most groups that have been around for a long time do not lose money. I've never lost money on them. Um, but that's not to say you can't, uh, for sure. You just have to be super careful. Is this a large portion of Integrity Capital's loans or like? No, it's, I would say we have not pursued it as heavily as we could. Um, and it, I can tell you it's probably going to become more prevalent for Integrity Capital going forward, um, you know, especially as we go into the recession. Um, so it's definitely, you know, I've always been a little bit leery of that market uh, just because, you know, you have to be real careful because uh, it could be, you can deal with some shady characters. So you have to be pretty discerning because guys kind of make a living floating from lender to lender and kind of, you know, uh, doing things they shouldn't. So you just have to keep a pretty good head. It's kind of like, you know, one of my friends said the other night, he said, you always got to have your head on a swivel, like when you're playing football, because otherwise you run down the field and you get, you know, T-boned by somebody that just can't see him coming. Uh, but, you know, so hard money loans are great. Uh, I like them. Uh, they're very profitable. And they they help people. I mean, they, people have to close and get in the pickle. So, uh, yeah. So any other questions? Go ahead. When you're like in the interview process with them, you don't even, because you said you don't talk about their credit score or any really other background. And I like kind of get why you do that because it doesn't really matter, but you do not look like into any really thing other than that. Uh, here's our philosophy on it. I look, I do a background check. I don't do a credit because I don't care. Uh, but I do a background check just to see if they have any fraud or anything major like litigious issues. Uh, there was a deal we were looking at a while back and the guy had this huge SEC violation. Uh, he was under investigation for fraud. And, um, you know, I, I, I tend to believe him. I mean, he kind of told me a story and, um, and I think he was probably accurate, but I just told him, I said, look, I can't do this because when I, when it's me versus the SEC, I mean, that there's just too many risks there that yeah, I, I just don't even, I said, if you get that all cleared up and you get a document that states that that's closed out and you're deemed clean, and that we could revisit it, but you know, um, I mean, I just did a deal for a guy. So what I look at is, is legal issues. I look at, uh, you know, if they're in the middle of litigation, okay, we just did, we did a, a huge piece of land, we funded in house and it took me two weeks because this guy was involved in so many lawsuits to get through all the paperwork to figure out if, if he was, I don't want to say acquitted, but if the legal, the lawsuits were done, like there was no more lawsuits pending. And uh, we ended up funding the loan uh, for him. We did really, really well. And he made out fine. We got him out. We saved his hiney, I guess is what I'll say. Uh, and, you know, got him out of a pickle. And uh, so everybody won. But I just look at a lot of legal things, fraud, lawsuits, those things scare me. Credit, I, don't, I just don't, I don't care because you're coming to me because something's wrong. I don't, <laughs> I'm assuming you have bad credit. Um, that's, that's what we look at first thing. And then I do my own comp analysis, you know, make sure there's no uh, environmental issues, no title issues. And, and then, you know, I just try to find out how am I going to get this loan taken out? You know, like, are you going to sell it? 
Are you going to refinance me out? How are you going to refinance me out? What's going to take? Uh, those are the types of things I want to pull. So, does that answer your question? Yeah, thank you. Yeah, good question. Um, so, bridge lenders. You guys remember what is a bridge lender? Pretty similar to a hard money loan. Like it's pretty like quick. It's like a year, I think six months to a year max. Uh, it's like fifty percent LTV, a little lower of an interest rate because of that. It's around like five and a half percent ish. Um, also, like low credit people. Um, I don't think it's like the most glamorous properties in the world either. Um, non recourse interest only. Yeah, bridge. Yeah, good. Yeah, so bridge lenders are there. There is definitely some crossover with hard money. Okay, there is distinctions, but there is also crossover. Um, I would say the distinction is a bridge lender does larger loans. Okay, that's one difference. They tend to do call it five to ten million and higher. Okay. Where a hard money lender will do 250, a half a million, a million bucks. The other distinction is bridge lenders really are looking for those types of loans where somebody is buying a, call it a tired, dilapidated asset, and they're trying to spruce it up and lift the rents with the intention of owning it and refinancing them out or selling the property. That's kind of the model. They're just basically, so is, go ahead. So is the majority of that loan for like tenant improvements, just renovations, to like what you said, to boost the property? Yes, exactly. It is, it is predominantly what we call good news or tenant improvement dollars, okay, where they're going to come in and you know, say, okay, you know, I'm going to turn a unit over in this apartment complex and I'm going to put in a new, you know, kitchen and floor and, you know, bathroom and blah, blah, blah. And, uh, you know, so they would do like what we call minor renovations. Uh, you know, they don't do all out construction, like massive, you know, construction. They're just going to do something that's cleaned up lift the rents, turn all the units, and then take them out, okay? Um, there were literally, I could, I could, every week, just, I was just getting literally flooded every day with bridge lenders calling, just, hey, we put out bridge loans, and I'm like, you and every other Tom, Dick, and Harry, you know, I mean, you know, they're just flooding the market, and it was so competitive, and now, like, they've all gone silent because they just got their tail hammered to them uh, when the market kind of turned. So why, why was it because interest rates were super low? So they were just offering for pretty much free money. Okay. Yeah. I mean, like here, here's the rule of thumb. When you ever see a recession coming here to see uh, tons of influx of lenders come in, the money gets really loose. Uh, underwriting gets loose. Loan to values get really high interest rates are really low. That's like, you know, when you start seeing that happen and it just starts to feel, feel like it's on overdrive, that's a really good time to say, I gotta get out of this market. Um, and that's what happened. So like with a recession coming, like what, like what kind of measures do you try to take to kind of lessen the blow when it were to happen? I mean, yeah. obviously like, right. Yeah, it's a good question. We one of our uh, core convictions is um, running lean. Um, you know, we don't have debt. Um, we don't have massive overhead. Uh, we we just we run lean because there'll be lean times. Um, that's probably one of the major things that we do to recession proof ourselves. And then also we just run nimble, means that we, we're 
we are flexible and we move to the areas that we feel like are still moving and we take, we just stay away from the ones that aren't. Um, and, you know, so we just, we been, put ourselves in a really good position financially to say we can still thrive through this recession because we were not laden with overhead and debt. That kills companies all the time, happens all the time. Um, and they, they just they just literally mass lay people off. They cut everything because they were just so overloaded. They didn't need to. Um, they were just top heavy. So that's that's what we do is we run lean, we shift and we pivot. And by the way, we we've, we've been talking about the recession for the last year uh, yeah. here at our firm. I mean, we've been preparing for this for a year because I just told the firm. I said, look, I said it's coming. And I said, I don't know when, because I'm not, you know, God. And uh, you know, it's, I just said, but it will happen. And, uh, and I said, you know, they said, you know, everybody always says this time's different. And I said, it's not, it will come. Um, and, you know, so you just have to put yourself in a position to thrive. And the question we really ask that no, most people won't, because everybody just usually get literally just checks out. They just, they're just like, uh, I'm staying out of the market. We don't think that way. We actually get excited when recessions come. And we ask ourselves the question, how can we thrive? And where is the greatest place to have success in this recession? And we just ask different questions. When you ask a question, you'll just get a different answer. You know? um, and, so that's, and so we've been able to find that and do well just because we establish good relationships with very strong people. Uh, we do things above board and we, you know, we work really hard and we don't have tons of, we don't have any debt, I guess. Kind of a, so what are the certain things that Integrity Capital does to like stay lean? Um, well, yeah, the first thing is we don't have any debt. You know, that's, we do literally have zero debt. Um, we, uh, we basically hire really, really smart people and we don't have to like overload with, you know, one person could probably handle three things, right? Like we don't, we don't have to get something for every little position. Uh, and the other things we do is we keep our office expense low. You know, we don't have to have the, you know, the high fluten over the top doesn't mean we don't have nice things. We don't have a nice office. We just don't have to, you know, get the over the top stuff. Um, and so we, so what would I tell our staff is that we invest heavily in areas that we believe will get the highest ROI. And we don't invest in things that we feel don't have an ROI, you know, silly trinkets, little things that don't matter, just, stuff that just doesn't, you're just not getting an ROI for it. Um, and so when we had spend money, we always just ask ourselves the question. Most of the time, I just like spending money on people and investing in staff and investing in their growth and success. And, and then obviously investing in, you know, uh, investments and opportunities. Um, so just people and infrastructure and things like that. That's kind of our attitude um, towards it. And then just stay away from debt and you, you keep enough uh, dry powder uh, that when things slow down, that you're not freaking out. Because when you do that, you make stupid decisions and we don't wanna have to make dumb decisions. We wanna be patient. We wanna wait, we wanna watch. And then when the opportunity comes, we're ready. We're ready to, to win, you know, so th that's that's kind of our position. Um, the reason why is because I've actually lived it a couple of times and every one of the guys that are super successful have the same attitude, which is, you know, you just don't, you know, what this industry, you do really well. So it's like a squirrel. They prepare for the winter. And winter's here, so that's our, that's kind of our attitude. Is you just have to store up for the lean time, and then that's when you actually make probably most of your wealth. Is when everybody else is running out of the market. You know, Warren Buffett always says that. 
everybody's running away, I want to run in. Because that means there's an opportunity to buy something for cheap or lower price. Yeah. So, does that make sense? Yeah, thank you. Yeah, good questions. And, uh, and this is a fantastic business to be in. Uh, but it's not for everybody. Uh, it's just not, you know, I was talking to a guy who just quit his job at Goldman Sachs to come work in the industry and I said, how are you doing? He goes, this is tough. I said, yeah. He said, you're going to get some wisdom wounds. He goes, wisdom wounds. And I said, yeah, that's gray hairs. I said, that's, you'll have a lot of, a lot of lessons. So, um, so, uh, good questions. Good questions. Um, so bridge lenders are good. They're out there. There's a huge market for that. Again, somebody could make a whole career just on bridge lenders. Um, there's always old buildings that need to be cleaned up, right? It's never going to go away. Uh, so you could, you could do really well there. Um, you walk through each one of the scenarios. I had you walk through those just so you can kind of start to think through scenarios. I'm not going to walk through them today because we just need to move on. But if you did have questions or something that you felt like, hey, this didn't make sense to me or I'm happy to answer it, you know, but if you didn't. I had, I had one question going back to Bridge. It mentioned something about a CLA. I didn't know what that was. Yeah, CLA is uh, uh, a... Um, it's a collateralized loan obligation. So it's like a, uh, well, what was the context? I guess, what did it, do you remember what it said? I had, um, it was talking about like turnaround time and decision, 24, 48 hours um, to have a decision by. And then I had, it said, I had, what's a, CL, a CLA? It could have been CLA. So that would have also made sense. Yeah, I, I'm trying, I'm trying, trying, to, to, trying to think of a, there's like CLO, which is a collateralized loan obligation, and then there's CL. I'm trying to think of a CLM. Um, I could have caught it wrong. You may not have been A. Yeah, I think the only thing is like a, a CML, which is a is commercial mortgage loan, but I don't know. I don't know if I know a CLA. I'll try to go back after. Yeah, if, if you see it, let me know. And then I can, if I kind of hear the context, I might be able to, you know, answer it. But yeah, I don't even know what that acronym would be. So, and there's tons of acronyms in this industry. Uh, that one, I, that one, I'm just not putting, putting it together as CLA. So, yeah. So if you, if you know the context, let me know. And then I can, I'll try to answer it. Yeah, of course. Any other questions or anything that you had a question about? Uh, Not no big deal. We'll move on. Um, okay, so so let me just kind of tee up a little bit as we go into this, uh, you know, kind of landing strip so to speak of all these things okay just just to rewind a little bit now remember you started off kind of learning about culture okay and culture is a really big deal uh you guys are newer in kind of your fret you know you're in college you're coming out and you know if, if if i had somebody with a little bit further ahead of me i would say what what matters most when i'm looking for a position somewhere and i would tell you leadership and culture that like, honestly, like those two things are like the number one thing I would focus on. You say, well, what does that even mean? And how do you know? A good leader um, cares about you, number one, but number two, they have an intentional way they're going to grow you. That's, that's a good leader. They have a very intentional way that you're going to grow in your particular position. Culture really is all about, you know, let me just put it this way. Either way, you go into a place, there is a culture, okay? So the question really is, is it a healthy one 
or an unhealthy. And the unhealthy ones are typically ones where you have bad leadership with no intention on how they're going to run the culture. Okay. Um, good ones have good leaders who do everything on purpose and with an intention in mind. Okay. And that's what you're looking for. And so you have to ask questions when you're interviewing and doing all that stuff to say, okay, tell me about the culture. How do people function? How do you do things? What is the culture? If someone can't describe that to you, probably ought to wrap it up. Um, so culture is a really big deal because it literally binds people together. A positive one does. It builds unity and it, it makes it so people can go way further, way faster than they would ever do on their own. Uh, I have personally experienced that. I've seen it happen with our culture. I've seen it happen with other cultures. It is an absolute thing that works. And people have awesome experiences working. They develop really great relationships with people and they grow like crazy more than they ever would. Uh, and companies thrive uh, financially if they build a good culture. Okay. So that's what I, something I want to keep encouraging you guys uh, just to always be thinking about. That's why we spend so much time having you think about things. What do I want to be? Who do I want to be? Um, you know, you got to be thoughtful if you want to attract the right kind of culture. Okay. Um, the second thing again was, you know, sort of the industry, you know, you have to make a decision in your career, but you have to think about like, do I really want to be in this industry? So we spent a lot of time and effort building this out for people like you guys to say, I hate this and I never want to do it. And my response is then we accomplished our mission because we don't want you to do something you don't want to do, right? You want to find something that makes you go, this is really exciting. You know, and I believe it's an absolutely robust industry that's not going away. It's going to be around for eons. And it's the predominance of the wealth in the United States and the world is commercial real estate, okay? Um, so it's, a, it's an absolute thriving, robust area that you can have a fantastic career, make a lot of money. Okay. That, not that that's the point of life. So don't, don't misconstrue what I'm saying, but you can do really well financially and you can have a good lifestyle. It means you don't have to kill yourself to, to do well, to work your butt off, but you don't have to kill yourself. Okay. Um, so that's the other piece to think about. Uh, the third thing was my terminology. You guys remember the kind of my terms? So we just went through all these terms. And the reason we did that is so that you could have some idea. I don't know why this keeps doing this. I could just go to the dark every time. <laughs> See you guys. Like, what is going on? <laughs> Maybe that was kind of the whole piece is that you're saying, you know, good, good, uh, Good leaders uh, are light and bad ones have darkness over them. And then all of a sudden the darkness comes over my issue. So maybe that was like an omen or something. <laughs> um, so um, so we just walked you through my term. All the purpose of that was so you guys have some clear idea uh, on the language that we're talking about. Okay. And then we talked about, you know, the application. How do we screen? Okay, what are we looking for in people, clients, all those things? So we don't waste our time and that you can focus on working on good deals. If you take nothing away from this whole thing, you think about this. Be in the business of disqualifying people, not qualifying them and deals. Uh, because you only have a finite time. So you have to have a criteria to say, I want to say no to 90% so I can say yes to the 10. Okay. It's kind of like your 
dating life, right? Like you want to have a really clear criteria so your date can go really fast, go get your cup of coffee, and it either lasts hours like I did with my wife finally and married her and the rest of the coffee dates, right, lasted about 10 minutes, okay? So you just want to think through that and have a criteria <laughs> and go to it fast, right? So you don't waste a lot of time. Uh, and so that's part of what we're trying to teach you. And that will, that applies also just in your own life, just relationships and things like that. So want to be real careful and cautious. Um, and then, um, obviously we went through loan program, education, mining scenarios, so that you have a filter to be able to minister, so to speak to people, consult them, give them advice, give them wisdom as to which direction they should go and why, okay? So as we go into this last section, this is really gonna be centered on modeling and it's talking about analysis and underwriting. So we'll be really going through a couple of different quadrants. So personal tax analysis, okay? Uh, and in that you're gonna be dealing with, you know, um, you know personal financial statements, um, really trying to understand, like, how do I understand the, the person's 1040? Okay, so someone gives you a tax return and you're trying to understand how do I get to cash flow from this person? So you're going to learn how to get to cash flow uh, from a person. And then the second portion is business tax analysis. So how do I get to cash flow on a business? Okay, uh, so personal, business, and then the final one is the income property analysis. Okay. So you have this kind of tripart thing of where you can look at cash flow and know how to size up a person's cash flow. You'll be able to look at a business and know how to size up business cash flow. And then you'll know how to size up a property and how to underwrite a property so that you can say this makes sense or it doesn't. You know, I just had a client come in today and, you know, he's, you know, a trying to build an apartment complex. It's a big one. And we were underwriting the project and we realized your expense ratio is like 15%. And that's really, really low. And so him and I just had a talk right before I got on with you guys. And I said, look, I said, I do a lot of apartments. And I said, I've never seen somebody able to run a property at a 15% expense ratio. It just seems very light. Um, and so I just said, I think you're, you know, there's just no way we're going to get it done. So you're going to have to kind of figure out how to change it, you know, um, because there's just no way you can really operate under that. So, so just, you get to learn how to look at things so you can quickly discern if something makes sense or not. Okay. So that's the goal here. Uh, so you guys want you to dive in. Uh, this is probably going to be the hardest section saving the last for best, best for last type thing. Um, and so, um, uh, and so we'll dive in. So I'd like you guys to really try to get as far as you can on the personal tax analysis. Uh, and then we'll pick up on it next week um, so that you guys can start to understand like how, how does this, you'll watch a video, you'll do an assignment around an attorney and an automotive company, a small business car wash. And then I have the answers, okay, for these things in these videos too. So you'll have the answers for the personal financial statement, tax analysis, et cetera, et cetera, okay? So, and then we'll walk through these. So what I want to encourage you is go through it. And if you don't understand something, even after watching the video, uh, just bring that question. So I definitely want to make this as interactive as possible. Otherwise, you're not really going to learn it. So you got to do it, fail, right? Like, I don't, this makes no sense. Walk me through. And then we get, we'll unpack that uh, just because it's, you know, it's something you're really going to have to dive into and uh, you'll have templates. Okay. So you want us to watch the video, do the assignments, but don't watch the videos. You know, it, no, I mean, if you, what I would say is if you do the assignment, um, definitely watch the answer videos for sure. Um, and that may answer your question. Um, 
but if you get back on and you're still kind of like, okay, I don't quite still understand it, um, we'll walk through it. But if there's something you're getting stuck on or something that doesn't make sense, definitely let me know. Um, and if you see an error or something that just isn't right, let me know too. Um, just meaning if something is, you know, you didn't really understand or didn't make sense, we'll fix it. So, um, so definitely, definitely walk through it and then I'll try to, to size it up for you guys and we'll, so you guys can really understand cash flow because this will be a big deal for you guys. Um, you know, so you know, you know how to size up a deal. Okay. Do you want us to do all three of them by Monday? Or? Yeah. I'd like, to, I'd like you to give it a shot if you can't, because again, I want to be sensitive to the fact you guys have homework and, you know, other things, just try to do as much you can without killing yourself, I guess, you know, so it's just, you know, it goes, you know, my, my philosophy is, you know, I, I don't want you to be too comfortable, but I also don't want to crush you, right? I'm always trying to just stretch people. Uh, it's the same philosophy I have for myself is, you know, my goals, I try to stretch them. So they're just like, well, it's a little bit of a push, but I don't want to make them to where it's like, that's nuts. And I don't even know that's just not even going to happen. You know, so I definitely want you to stretch yourself, but I also don't want you to be so frustrated that you're just like, this is, this guy's an idiot. Why is he having us do this? So make sense. Yeah. Okay. Well guys have a uh, wonderful weekend. Uh, enjoy. I uh, hope you win your football games, uh, whoever it is your team is, and uh, cross those fingers. And uh, we'll uh, we'll see you guys next week, okay? Yeah. Thank Thanks you. So Thanks, guys. All right. Take care.